Lauren. My name's Natalie Rubio and I'm a New Harvest Research Fellow. So I'm originally from Boulder, Colorado, where I got my bachelor's degree in chemical and biological engineering. Um, I spent the past, the last two years of my college degree um, working with New Harvest, and I also spent some time with the Mufri Perfect Day Foods guys over in Ireland, and that was my first introduction to the cellular agriculture field. Um, I spent the year after graduation in Silicon Valley doing the software startup thing um, before I found out that New Harvest was offering a fellowship specifically for PhD students um, to focus research on cultured meat. So that brought me to Tufts University in Boston, where I'm working under Dr. David Kaplan in the biomedical engineering department at Tufts. So I'm going to talk today about scaffolding. I'm going to talk about what scaffolds are, why they're important for progressing cultured meat research, and I'll go over a few examples of how researchers are using them. So I wanted to um, give a couple different representations of what scaffolds can look like. There isn't really one ideal scaffold that we're aiming to make. Um, scaffolds come in a variety of shapes and sizes and compositions, and what it will end up looking like is really dependent on the characteristics that we want our meat to have. So on the left, we have a very zoomed in um, example of a scaffold. So these are man-made fibers that were designed to have similar properties to collagen and elastin, so cells would really like to grow on them. Um, so we can see the cells there uh, interacting with their surface proteins holding on to this um, man-made fiber. Uh, the center photo is a zoomed out different scaffold, so from a little farther away um, in the scale of microns, and the red is a porous collagen scaffold, and we can see um, the green representing fibroblast cells interacting with it. The last example is a macroscopic photo, um, something you can see with your naked eye of a scaffold. So the cells are obviously too small to see, but this is um, a mesh scaffold that Wake Forest um, developed. You can see it's submerged in growth media, and the researchers are forming it to uh, form this conical shape. So these three examples are for medical applications, not for meat. Um, for uh, the medical field, it's important for scaffolds to have a few similar important characteristics. First of all, shaping non-living material is a lot easier to work with than trying to get cells to behave. So using acellular materials is good for shaping the overall structure of the tissue. For example, if you want to grow an ear, um, you will make a scaffold that looks like an ear and from then you'll seed cells onto it. Second, surface area. Adherent cell types, like muscle cells, really like to hold on to stuff. This is as opposed to like red blood cells that like to flow through your blood vessels and those would grow in suspension. But muscle cells are definitely adherent cells. So um, our scaffolds will give them a lot of surface area, which is why you'll see those tiny fibers and really porous, holy scaffolds um, to give the cell. Third, um, guiding development. The composition, the texture, the mechanical properties of scaffolds have a lot of influence on how cells behave and therefore how your tissue develops. So cellular agriculture has largely piggybacked off um, advances in the medical industry. So it makes sense that for food, these um, characteristics are also important. But we also have other things to think about because it's possible that the scaffold that we grow our meat cells on will be carried through to the end product and will end up in the meat that the consumers will eat. So in this case, we have to think about what texture it will give the meat when they bite into it. Um, it can also add to the nutritional profile. Um, and of course, taste is really important. So we have to think about the relative amounts of scaffold we're using and the composition, as well as how it'll appear to the consumers, how we're gonna market it. So when I started my research at Tufts, I was really inspired by the native structure of me when I started to think about how I was going to make my own scaffolds. So these are two um, images of turkey muscle. Me and my undergraduate student, Victor, who's here somewhere, went to the store and just bought some turkey meat um, and sectioned it. So on the left is an image close uh, to what Marie showed with the muscle structure. We're looking directly into the muscle fibers. And on the right, um, these are a long side, so you can see the length of the muscle fibers. Uh, and for scale, that scale bar is 100 microns, which is 
the average muscle uh, fiber bundle is between 100 and 200 microns, the average diameter of a human hair, so very, very tiny. The pink color is the proteins and cytoplasm of the muscle cells themselves, and then you can see these deep violet um, dots This is what I think of as the scaffold in native uh, muscle. Um, it has structural properties, so it kind of helps the muscle fibers stay aligned in one direction, which is helpful when um, they're generating efficient contractions. And it also provides elasticity so that muscles can contract and then return to their normal position. So I they kind of collapsed when we took the cells off. And how we did this was by decellularizing it. So exactly how it sounds, um, we take some chunks of meat and we remove the cells. So you basically stir it around in some soapy water that disrupts the cell membranes and the cells can be rinsed out and then what's left behind is just the connective tissue, extracellular matrix proteins. So we can further analyze this um, using techniques like liquid chromatography, mass, mass spectrometry, to see what composition of proteins is made up of, um, what types of collagen, fibronectin, laminin, et cetera. So that is native muscle tissue. That's what we want to get at. But things happen quite differently in the lab. Cells grow in 2D. So like Marie showed you, we have our cell culture flasks. We put our cells in this growth media and they settle to the bottom of the flask. So one or two days after plating, if you look at the bottom of your flask under a microscope, you'll see something as uh, we can see on the right. So a bunch of muscle cells attached to the This influences um, their access to the media. Since half of the cell is holding on to the plastic surface of the cell culture flask, you only have 50% of the cell membrane able to exchange nutrients and waste products with the growth media. Even if we could induce these cells to grow on top of each other, which some cell types can, we would still have a problem with um, access to media. So there's this concept called the nutrient and oxygen diffusion limit, um, which basically means that if a cell is more than 100 or 200 microns away from access to a blood supply or in cell culture, our growth media, it will begin to die. So we could have our cells on top happily living with access to media, but as you go deeper into the layer of tissue, cells are dying. So for the consumer, the difference between two-dimensional cell culture and three-dimensional cell culture using scaffolding is the difference between processed meat products like ground beef and chicken nuggets versus structured meat products like chicken and steak and bacon. And these are both awesome options, but if we really want to um, take over the meat market, we're going to have to learn how to make structured products as well. And this is where scaffolding comes in. So like I said earlier, I was really inspired by the native structure of muscle tissue. So on the left, we have the same photo of uh, turkey muscle. And on the right is a picture of a sponge uh, that I made at Tufts University. I found this awesome publication um, done by researchers at the University of Washington where they used a special process to make these chitosan sponges with really aligned pores. So instead of having like random pores throughout, each one of these is just like a tube that goes straight back, um, similar to uh, the muscle tissue. We can also change the properties depending on the concentration that we use. For example, um, we can go from this fluffy uh, matrix that falls apart in your hand to a really dense sponge that's even hard to cut with a knife. So all of our scaffolds should share some common characteristics. They should be effective, meaning they grow muscle really well, um, exercisable, so we need our muscle cells to be exercised like we would so that they can grow really thick. So this could be mechanically flexible, so they could be mechanically stimulated, or it could be conductive to electricity so we could electrically stimulate the cells. And being animal free is obviously important. Um, we can't use animal products to make animal products. 
Um, collagen is a really popular scaffold for medical applications, but because it's derived from uh, decellularized uh, meat, uh, it would be silly to use it. So our field has these special challenges. One thing that a scaffold could end up looking like is we use it in production and it's carried through to the final product and it's something that consumers ingest, just like we ingest connective tissue and meat. A second option is that the scaffold is used during production, but then it's detached from the cells and consumers eat the tissue and the scaffold can maybe be reused to grow more cells. I'm gonna go through a couple of examples that could be potential cultured meat scaffolds. Uh, this research comes from Curtin University in Australia. They used an aqueous silk protein solution to make porous sponges. Um, this is a microscope photo on uh, the left showing the morphology. And they seeded muscle cells in these. Um, the photo to the right is one millimeter by one millimeter um, height and width, and it's about a tenth of a, a millimeter thick. It's pretty successful for tissue engineering. Um, and you can't see the scaffold, but the green lines are the outline of the muscle cells. So this looks good because they're all nicely aligned. It seems to have a bunch of them. Um, so silk seems like a promising scaffold. It's pretty effective, biocompatible, cells like it. Um, it's flexible, you can customize it. Silk is actually edible. Um, I've heard it's a bit chewy, but uh, it has that going for it. But it's not animal free because we use cocoons from silkworms. But uh, this is not set in stone. We could use recombinant silk. Um, but in that case, it would probably not be very cost effective. A second example is patterned collagen. Um, I really like this one. So again, you have your porous sponge, but these researchers um, from Japan, the Institute uh, for Materials and Nanoarchitectonics, um, made these molds and cast a collagen gel over it, um, lyophilizing it, free drying it, free freeze drying it to make these sponges. And by controlling the shape of the mold, they could control the shape of these grooves. So um, the one in the middle is 200 microns in diameter. The one on the right is a little bigger, a little smaller. They ended up finding the one with 200 micron diameter was pretty successful, which makes sense, because that's the diameter of a muscle fiber bundle. Um, I thought these photos were really awesome. So these are showing the cells um, that have developed into muscle fibers in the uh, collagen scaffold. So you can see they're beautifully aligned, and they also look really dense. The picture on the bottom is looking at it um, kind of like a cross section. So you can see that's a pretty round, good muscle fiber bundle. So collagen is awesome for most reasons, except for it is not animal free. Yet again, this is not set in stone. You could make collagen recombinantly. People have made human collagen using tobacco plants. And Rice University has made some synthetic collagen. So there are options there. My last example is cellulose. So this research done by the Pelling Lab in Ottawa um, used plants. And just like I was talking about decellularizing meat, you can decellularize plants. And just like when you decellularize meat, what's left behind is the connective tissue. When you decellularize plants, what's left behind is cellulose or the cell walls. So this is a photo of decellularized apple. And they took this and grew a bunch of different cell types on it, including muscle cells. Um, you can see the scaffold outlined in red and the green and the blue are uh, the cells that have infiltrated the apple and have um, survived. They grew these for up to 12 weeks and the cells survived inside, which is an awesome start. It didn't look like they really formed muscle fibers, so that's an area for improvement. Um, so cellulose is super cost effective, definitely edible, really marketable, animal free, but we need to work on optimizing it specifically for muscle. So some takeaways from this presentation, processed meat can be developed using two-dimensional cell culture techniques, but it's really important that we progress to three-dimensional cell culture so that we can get structured meat products and also get that surface area so we can come up with a really efficient process. Scaffolds, um, at the heart of scaffolding is basically there's support structures so that they can guide development of tissue um, and give them the surface area for adherent cells to attach onto. Culture meat scaffolds will take a variety of steps, uh, shapes, and sizes, and it's possible that we could use more than one for the same product. So there's a lot of innovation um, available in this field. And it will also affect the end product a lot when it comes to the taste and texture and composition. 
I'd like to thank my lab. This is my PI at Tufts University, David Kaplan, who's been extremely supportive, um, and my students that I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, Andrew Stout and John Ewan are two new PhD students who have joined me this year. So um, I'm pretty excited to be working on these projects with them.